Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 28th of June 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That's mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is, of course, Crisis 2. Oh, yes. I've got to say, though, look out a little bit later on in the video for some very irritating nonsense. Doors that cannot be opened. Rrr. Crytek, what are you doing? Anyway, this one comes in from a Henrik that says, As you were talking about modding extending the shelf life of games in your 27.6 episode, you mentioned how publishers are money-grubbing pricks and that they like to keep mods off the web as to not cut into DLC sales. At that point, an idea struck me. Why not make high-quality mods purchasable through some sort of microtransaction system that seems to permeate almost every AAA game in some way these days? Have the modder and the publisher strike a deal to give the modder a share of the profits from the sales. I do realize there are some flaws in this logic, such as alienating small, not as experienced modders, or mods that are basically bug fixes, since customers cannot be expected to pay an extra fee in order to get the game working. The developers should have taken care of that in the first place. However, for mods such as Natural Selection, which are more likely entirely different games in their own right, this model might be applicable. I'm really just thinking out loud. What I'm asking is, do you think a system like this would be viable in any form, or is there another way to make publishers less hostile towards modding? Also, you're welcome to our Viking germs. Die. Anyway. I am very surprised that more companies have not done this already. Yeah, this is something that's supposedly coming in Heart of the Swarm now. It was supposed to be coming with the original release of StarCraft 2, and for some reason it was pushed back. And actually, that probably ended up being a good thing, because it's given people a lot of time to really get to know the editor. And as such, when the store comes out, the high-quality mods are going to be of much higher quality than they would have been earlier. I am in full support of modders and people that make custom maps being able to make profit from the work. In fact, I'm in support of anybody that does work making profit from it. It's entirely reasonable. That's how, as far as I'm concerned, the world should be working in that regard. Yes, volunteer work is admirable, but at the end of the day, if you work, you should be able to get compensated for it if you want to be. This is a reason why I was very much anti the idea of Blizzard banning premium mods for World of Warcraft, and I still am against that. As far as I'm concerned, if people want to charge for their mods, they should be able to do that. Lua code does not belong to Blizzard as much as they would like to believe otherwise, and as a result, even though the code doesn't work with any other game, it was still created by someone else. It wasn't created by Blizzard as such. These people should be compensated for that if they want to. And at the end of the day, it is a capitalist market, and if people don't want to use premium mods, they won't. There will always be free alternatives. And that's what it comes down to. Are you willing to pay for something that's really good quality? Or do you want to take the lesser free version? And as far as I'm concerned, if you limit the opportunity to actually make some of your money back, then you also limit the number of modders that there are. I mean, extremely talented modders are just going to go make their own game. There are now more engines than you can ever possibly imagine to get a hold of and reasonable licenses, even with stuff like Unreal 3 and Unity and things like that, that could be used by modders of exceptional skill to the point where they're basically programmers. So they can make their own game and sell it on Steam. So we don't want to be skimming that off. We get what's called brain drain if that happens. If modders are utterly incapable of making any money back, at least maybe to just buy food so they can eat and live, you know, to sustain their hobby, then we're gonna get brain drain because these really talented people are just going to go to a place where they can make some money from their skill. And you can't expect people to do things for free for you all the time. It's absolutely absurd, particularly considering the amount of work that goes into a high-end mod these days. That said, there are a number of problems with the premium system. If you're going to have a marketplace, then who's going to police it? Can anyone put any old crap on there? Because if that's the case, then you start running into problems. And it becomes very difficult to actually moderate that. Are you going to give the power to say whose mod can be sold and whose can't to the publisher? Because then we have the same problem as we had with the Apple Store, for instance, whereby you've got Apple rejecting things for nebulous reasons, no reason whatsoever, or because somebody's created something that's actually better than something Something they already have or is competing with a feature or is doing something they just don't want to happen and that's a very very restrictive model so how do you moderate it how does that happen do you rely on community moderation because i don't believe you can rely on that I think community moderation is extremely unreliable when applying to pretty much everything, and it tends to become a p cult of personality. It tends to become very much a hive mind kind of system. And of course, it's open to widespread abuse. You get one mod turn around and say to their fans, well, you know this competing mod? We don't like them, so downvote them to hell. You know, make them one star. Drive them out of the store. That's a horrible system to have happen. 
So while it is a good idea, I am very concerned about its implementation and I'm not sure it can be pulled off properly. If it can, great. And I would agree with your sentiment that it is another potential revenue stream, as well as giving modders an opportunity to actually make some money back for their hard work. And everyone wins in that regard. So if they can find a fair way to do it, they should, without question. And I'm hoping that the marketplace for StarCraft 2 will be the start of that. This one comes in from Dr. Obviously, who says, In the aftermath of your Duke Nukem Forever videos, I wondered why so many games these days have a two or three weapon limit. Ever since modern shooters started to get really popular, or maybe even sooner, the concept of having only two or three weapons seems to have applied to almost every shooter in recent memory. Sadly, even the Duke has had to bend over for this idea because of the lazy or terrified developers. Gearbox shouldn't take 100% blame, who are afraid the public won't like a throwback to ye olde ideas. Why is that? I remember playing through Resistance Fall of Man on the PS3 and I enjoyed that game thoroughly. You know what that game had as well? The choice of more than three weapons. That game became quite popular and is now the franchise we see today. Shouldn't this game have sent a signal to developers it was okay to put in more guns at a time? What are your thoughts on that? It comes down to two things. One is control limitations. For instance, they made the argument with Duke Nukem Forever that the reason they only allowed two guns at a time was because you couldn't fit the buttons on a controller. Why? Because you had the D-pad apparently bound to using things like Holoduke and stuff like that, and beer. And in reality, after I played like six hours of that game, then just gave up on it in sheer disgust. The amount of times I actually bothered to use a beer or a Holoduke, yeah, I could count them on the fingers of one hand. So it was really very much irrelevant. It was a dumb excuse. And this is what leads to the second more insidious point, which is developers want more control over what items you have at any particular point in the game because it's easier to balance that way. This whole idea of developers controlling precisely how you experience a game is, in my opinion, pretty damn disgusting. Most of the time, developers don't have the necessary skill to really give you that amazing experience in the way that can justify the amount of control they have over you. I mean, we've seen the amount of scripting, invisible walls, and all sorts of nonsense. Hell, even in Crisis 2 in the background, you run into stuff like that, which sucks, and it's annoying. At least that's got more freedom than most games, but whatever the case... When it came to Duke, it was like, in this bit, you're going to need explosive weapons. So here's an RPG or here's a Devastator. And you have to make sure that you pick that one up. And those limitations with the weapons and the swapping around, it comes down to difficulty balancing. So you can give a player a weapon at a certain point in the game that you know will give him the power to beat the next section and make sure he's got plenty of ammo for it. And of course, you can have that drop from a new enemy or it could be lying around in an ammo cache or all sorts of things like that. Again, it's a lazy lazy piece of design work. It is solely engineered to make sure that they have a more tight control over your play experience. And as far as I'm concerned, to hell with that. If your game is not properly designed in a way that you can approach it with pretty much any weapon from any angle, when we're talking about FPS at any rate, then you probably should have a look at your game design again. Because I've beaten, say, the entirety of Deus Ex with nothing but melee weapons. And it actually worked fairly well. It wasn't like I was deliberately handicapping myself. You can beat that game with melee weapons, and it's not amazingly hard. I've beat the game without killing anyone, except, I think, what one target that I had to, and yes, I glitched past Walton Simmons. So while arguments can certainly be made for the idea that the controller doesn't have enough buttons and you don't want to use modifier keys for swapping weapons around, there have been plenty of games that have that. Help. Red Faction Armageddon allows four weapons at a time, and one has to assume those are bound to the D-pad on an Xbox 360, I would think. It works perfectly fine. And more often than not, you'll find the D-pad isn't used for anything particularly useful. And also, I think developers really need to get over their fear of using modifier keys. I mean, for God's sake, you've got buttons. If you have just one button as a modifier, you double the number of buttons you've got on your front. So for God's sake, please trust the players to be able to use modifier keys. This one comes in from Sunday Cat that says, I looked on Steam today and found that the Steam store page had the Supreme Court in California's gaming law ruling written on it, along with a PDF link attached to it. After further looking into this topic, plus my own view, I came out with this conclusion. Personally, the Supreme Court ruled right, and not just with the First Amendment, but in case of lazy parenting. Parenting is and should be a responsibility, and thus the parents should try and educate their children not to think violently instead of being lazy and asking for government censorship. What are your thoughts on the Supreme Court ruling and the California law, along with the subject of parenting versus violent video games? Ah, that's, uh quite the topic, and also it borders very close, very, very close indeed on politics, which I try and avoid. That's a very complex multi-tiered question, but I'll try and simplify it 
As far as I'm concerned, there is no medical or psychological evidence of any description to indicate that playing violent video games actually makes you violent. There is some limited evidence to suggest a heightening of aggression, but as far as I'm concerned, and indeed this is the conclusion of a lot of very, very smart people, that this is just the competitive instinct and, of course, the survival instinct kicking in. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's the same kind of aggression you get from playing sports or indeed competing in any kind of contest. You want to win, and your survival instinct kicks in, your adrenaline level goes up, and all that good stuff. It's very easy to provide anecdotal evidence and say, well, I played violent video games and I turned out fine, but it does happen on a case-by-case -case basis. The thing is that there's no proof whatsoever to suggest that playing a lot of violent video games actually makes you want to go and do violent things. And indeed, there was a fantastic chart that I saw a very long time ago, which tracked the violent youth crime in America related to the release of Grand Theft Auto. And every time one got released, violent youth crime actually went down. And of course, correlation does not equal causation by any means, but it does demonstrate a lack of proof for the idea that, say, Grand Theft Auto being played by kids made them want to go and commit crimes. Indeed, I think this is something my mother said to me a very long time ago when I was very young. It was like, well, if you're playing games on the computer, I know you're not out there stealing cars. It's a valid point. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I have a seven-year-old stepson, and he's just started playing StarCraft II. Now, we have it on the reduced violence mode, so there's no brutal eviscerations and things like that. Not that I don't think he could handle it, but it just seems like you don't really want to show that to a kid at a really young age. It doesn't seem like the healthy thing to do, but I think that parents and indeed just adults in general sorely underestimate just how good a child is at distinguishing fantasy from reality. The idea that StarCraft 2, for instance, would make a seven-year-old be violent is absolutely absurd. I mean, the system is so alien to anybody. It doesn't have any relation to real life. You can't apply it to real life. Hell, I would say that playing cops and robbers or cowboys and Indians is far more violent, per se, than playing StarCraft 2 is. Because StarCraft 2 is about army control in the far future on distant worlds with freaking aliens. Eh? It's not real. It has no relation to real life. Whereas cowboys and Indians and cops and robbers, it's a little closer. But as far as I'm concerned, that's not harmful either. I didn't see anyone complaining around that time. Oh no, they've got toy plastic guns and they're shooting nerf darts at each other. Oh, that will make them violent. They'll make them want to use real guns and shoot people in light of life. No, there is no evidence of this. None whatsoever. At the end of the day, teenagers in particular are aggressive by default and they need means to vent that aggression. In fact, this is often the reason why you see teenagers acting like insufferable twats online because they are venting their pent-up frustration and aggression. And while that's not the healthiest way to do it by calling somebody a whatever the hell, at least they're venting it in a way that doesn't involve punching some dude in the face. That's nice. As far as I'm concerned, the gaming should be enough. The trash talk is irrelevant, but still. At least they're not going out and punching somebody. If you are a parent and you want to stop your kid from playing games like that, you can do that. There is really nothing stopping you from doing that. There's plenty of systems available. There are parental locks in place on consoles now. It's very easy to do it on PC as well. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what you should be doing. And for God's sake, just keep an eye on your kids. I mean, really. You don't send your kid in front of a television or a game for six or seven hours without checking in on them. That just seems absurd. I'm not going to give parenting advice. I don't have a huge amount of experience in the matter. I've only been doing it for a little while. But I just find the parental whining about the media corrupting their kids to be both completely misguided and insufferably weak. Seriously, parent your kids. It's as simple as that. That's what you're there for. That is your role. You chose to have kids, ergo they're your responsibility. Deal with it, stop blaming everybody else for it, and you will raise a great kid who will no doubt go on to do really well in life. If you just throw that responsibility out the window, then no doubt you'll probably raise a brat, and who knows, he might end up in jail. And it won't be anything to do with video games, I can tell you that for a fact. It'll be to do with the fact that you did not parent him properly. Ah, uh, too much moral high-horsing in this topic, folks. It's very, very difficult to approach. Hell, you could talk for hours on this, but at the end of the day, until someone comes up with conclusive proof that video games actually do cause violent behavior, then it should be assumed that they do not, considering that we don't have millions of kids running around gunning people down in the street after playing Grand Theft Auto at the moment. That, to me, should be telling that GTA is but a fantasy, and kids realize that very, very easily.
Okay, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching The Mailbox. I'll be back at some point tomorrow with yet more maily goodness. Whatever that means. I'll see you next time.